Hi friends, it's Miss Bell. Thanks for joining me today while we read another story. Today we're going to be reading a story called The Five O'Clock Band. This story was written by Troy Andrews and it was illustrated by Brian Collier. Remember, the author is the person who writes the words and the illustrator is the person who draws the pictures. All right, in this story, this little boy, Shorty, he misses his band practice. And then he starts to wonder about what it means to be a leader. Let's read this story and find out what happens. It's called The Five O'Clock Band. Everyone's hometown is special. It's the place that helps you grow into the person you'll become. For one little boy called Shorty, his hometown roots were very important. He was from New Orleans, and in this city, there are sounds and tastes and celebrations unlike any other place in the world. Many even call it magical. The city showed Shorty how to see the world, and its people helped him become the person he was destined to be. Shorty liked to play music. In fact, he was in a band. They called themselves the Five O'Clock Band because that was when they started playing every afternoon after school and homework were finished. The band lived in a lively neighborhood called Treme. The Five O'Clock Band would parade through the streets of Treme, down to Jackson Square in the center of town and back around, just like all the older musicians did. They played for the people for rounds of applause, and sometimes they even got tips. But one day, Shorty was practicing his trombone and got so lost in his own music that he forgot to meet the five o'clock band at their regular time. Shorty ran to Jackson Square, trombone in hand, but his bandmates had already left. He had missed their performance and parade, and he knew he had let them down. One day, I want to be the band leader. But how can that happen if I can't even get to the show on time? Shorty thought. Shorty walked through the neighborhood around the large square to the French Quarter where musicians gathered. He smelled delicious gumbo and jambalaya in the air and heard the sounds of other musicians echoing through the streets. But Shorty kept his head down. Not even the sounds of brass instruments could cheer him up, until suddenly he heard a booming voice cry out, Shorty, where are you at? Shorty looked up to see Tuba Treme. He was a giant of a man, but he was as sweet as pecan pie, and the sounds that floated out from his horn were even tastier. Tuba and his band had been playing in the quarter for as long as Shorty could remember, and they played songs that were now over 100 years old. Where are you at, Tuba? Shorty called back, feeling down. Looks like you've got the blues, little man, Tuba Treme had noticed Shorty's sad face. I miss the five o'clock band, and I don't know where they've gone. I'm afraid I won't have what it takes to be a real band leader if I can't even show up on time. Tuba Treme placed his giant horn to his lips. The first notes of When the Saints Go Marching In tickled Shorty's ears. Like so many other New Orleans musicians, Shorty had learned how to play his horn with his tune. Pride swelled in Shorty's chest as he had as he and Tuba played the same notes together that Louis Armstrong had played many years before them in these same city streets. Tradition, Tuba Treme said. Every band leader needs to know where music came from in order to move it forward. If you understand tradition and you keep it alive, you will be a great band leader. Thanks, Tuba, Shorty said as he waved goodbye. He hoped to be able to play just like Tuba Treme one day. Shorty continued walking through the quarter along the banks of the Mississippi River. A steamboat floated alongside him, and the steam whistle sounded. He thought about how many musicians had played on that river, even Louis Armstrong. Shorty blew his horn back to the steamboat and smiled. 
His growling stomach led him back toward home, but the scent of red beans and rice made him stop in his tracks. Where are you at, Shorty? Queen Lola called out from the window of her restaurant. Shorty was still feeling defeated, but no one could refuse a meal from Lola, the Creole queen, one of the best chefs in New Orleans, if not the world. Where are you at, Queen Lola? Shorty answered as he opened the door. Queen Lola served him a heaping plate of red beans and rice, along with andouille sausage, collard greens, and okra with tomatoes. She had been making this dish for over 50 years, treating everyone who came through her door like family, even Martin Luther King Jr. As Shorty dug in, he asked Queen Lola the question that was weighing on his heart. I let my bandmates down today, but I want to be a great band leader and make amazing music, just like you make amazing meals in your kitchen every day. How do you do it? Queen Lola smiled wide. Love, she said. There's love in my food because I love every dish I make. It's my special sauce. As long as you love what you do, you will always be a success. I don't love anything more than playing music, but this meal sure is close. Thank you, Queen Lola, Shorty said. Come by any time, Shorty, she said. Why don't you head back out and see if you can find your band? Shorty felt a little better now that his belly was full, but he knew he still had more to learn. As he walked toward Treme looking for his band, he heard the rumbling of drums in the distance. It sounded like glorious thunder. As he turned the corner, he stood face to face with the most majestic person he'd ever seen. We are Indians, a chant pierced through the warm, swampy air. It was the chief of the neighborhood Mardi Gras Indian tribe. Big Chief and his drummers chanted as they pounded out a rhythm. We are Indians, Indians, Indians of the nation, the whole wild creation. Shorty knew this song was a prayer that the Mardi Gras Indians sang before they marched down the streets. They believed the song would protect them on their journey as they went through the city looking for other tribes. Mardi Gras Indians only exist in New Orleans. They are a special group, sacred to the city. Where are you at, Shorty? Big Chief asked his group as his group slowed their drumming. Where are you at, Big Chief? Shorty hollered back. You and the tribe sound amazing. I'm actually looking for my group, the Five O'Clock Band, but I need to know, what does it take to be the Big Chief? Big Chief. Big Chief picked up his tambourine and shook it proudly as he looked up to the sky. Dedication, he said. Each year, all the Indians make new suits, hand sewn from scratch. It takes a lot of time and patience, but when we hit the streets, it's worth it. We are the soul of Mardi Gras. Shorty noticed how Big Chief's suit shimmered in the light. He thought about how important it was for him to practice his craft every day in order to carry the honor of being band leader. Suddenly, Shorty heard the familiar melody of a brass band in the distance and ran toward it. He knew those sounds could only come from the five o'clock band. And there were his friends parading down the avenue towards him. Where are you at? The five o'clock band sang. Where are you at? Shorty answered. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you guys today. I promise I'll never let you down again, Shorty said. But I learned that we have all the ingredients we need for success. We have dedication, we honor tradition, and most of all, we play with love. Now I know what it takes to lead. Well, why don't you start us off and take the lead right now, Shorty? One of the boys said. Shorty raised his horn to his lips, stepped out in front of the band, and played the opening notes of When the Saints Go Marching In. As the five o'clock band paraded home to Treme, they waved at the friends and neighbors who clapped their hands and danced in step behind them. The end. 
Thanks so much for reading with me today, friends. I hope you liked this story about Shorty and the 5 o'clock band. I'll see you guys again soon. Bye!